I, I want to thank you, Miles, for, for the introduction uh, and for your opening comments. Excuse get into me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and also thank you to Common Cause for inviting me to moderate this morning's opening plenary. Um, by now, you have already heard that last night, a deep-pocketed Manhattan multi-billionaire spending his own money dropped out of the race for the White House. And I'm not talking about Donald Trump. Uh, I'm sure you know it was former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg um, who wrote in a piece for Bloomberg View, the current presidential candidates are offering scapegoats instead of solutions, and they are promising results they can't possibly deliver. Rather than explaining how they will break the fever of partisanship that is crippling Washington, they are doubling down on dysfunction. Now, Bloomberg said the possibility that his entry into the race could lead to the election of Trump or Senator Ted Cruz of Texas was more than his conscience could bear. So here we are, facing the very real prospect that the nominee for a major political party in the United States will have gotten there on a wave of xenophobia, racism, and misogyny while destroying said party in the process. And he's self-financing a campaign that would be a wash in cash anyway, thanks to Citizens United. A ruling that has given super PACs in Wall Street outsized influence in both parties and on elections up and down the ballot all over the country. And for different reasons, money and race figure prominently in the presidential election of 2016. And no three people can put it all in perspective than the three who are here today, to my, to my right. Ian Haney Lopez has literally written the book on dog whistle politics. In Dog Whistle Politics, White by Law and Racism on Trial, he argues that over the last 50 years, the Republican Party, and to some extent the Democrats as well, have built their party around racial pandering. Lopez is the John H. Bold Professor of Law at the University of, Ber University of California at Berkeley, or is it University of Berkeley? I did a cut. UC Berkeley. UC Berkeley. UC Berkeley, UC Berkeley. Berkeley. University of California, California Berkeley. at Berkeley, where he teaches in the areas of race and constitutional law. His current research emphasizes the connection between racial divisions and growing wealth inequality in the United States. Chara Torres Spellacy is an associate professor of law at Setson University and a fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice. She teaches, she teaches courses, courses in election law, corporate governance, business entities, and constitutional law. Chara is the editor of the 2010 edition of the Brennan Center's campaign finance treatise, Writing Reform, a Guide to Drafting State and Local Campaign Finance Laws. And Norm Ornstein is a resident scholar for the American Enterprise Institute and a contributing editor and columnist to the National Journal and the Atlantic. His many books include The Permanent Campaign and Its Future, The Broken Branch, How Congress is Failing America and How to Get, get It Back on Track with Thomas E. Mann, and most recently, the New York Times bestseller, It's Even Worse Than It Looks, How the American Constitutional System Collided with the New Politics of Extremism. Before we get to our conversation, and more importantly, your questions, Ian, Chara, and Norm will each give a brief presentation on the 2016 race from their respective vantage points. Thanks, Tom. Oh, sorry. <laughs> from their respective vantage points. So let's start with Ian. Good and morning, all. Don't follow my example. Speak into the mic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lest we, lest we have somebody come and put the mic right in our faces. Thank you, Jonathan, very much. And good morning, everybody. How are you all? Good morning. OK, so, so Donald Trump, let's start there. Is he, is he a carnival barker? Is, is he a fascist demagogue? Um, yes to both. But by seeing him in those terms, we tend to think of him as unique, as something we haven't seen in American politics before. And I think that that's an enormous mistake. In, in fact, let me say, the media has gone from dismissing him to saying we've never seen something like this. But in either case, somehow Trump isn't telling us important things about America and what's been going on politically for 50 years. And that's actually the most important conversation. So I want to locate Trump in terms of racial politics. Race is not the only thing going on in American electoral politics, but I want to suggest to you that it is the most important thing going on in American electoral politics and has been since, since the civil rights era. In 1963, 
the Republican Party made a strategic decision that they could use race as a wedge issue to break the Democratic New Deal coalition of African Americans, the white working and middle class across the country, and liberals across the country. And they've been doing so ever since. Uh, let me give you some numbers to show just how dramatically successful they've been. 1964 was the last time a Democratic candidate for president won a majority of the white vote. It's been over 50 years since a Democratic candidate for president has won a majority of the white vote. Or think about it in terms of different numbers. The Republican Party today draws over 90% of its support from white voters. And now let me break down that number just a little bit. It's officially 89% from white voters, 6% from Hispanics, and then the remaining few percent. But if you know anything about Latinos, I guarantee you that 6% think they're white. So in effect, the Republican Party is drawing about 95% of its support from white voters. 98% of its elected officials are white. This is a party that has constituted itself as, as a white man's party. It is whiter than most country clubs. And this is no accident. In fact, I want to go back and pick up a quote from 1963. This is from Robert Novak who had just attended a meeting of the Republican National Committee, and he's writing uh, uh, this in, in one of his articles. He says, a good many, perhaps a majority of the party's leadership envisioned substantial political goal to be mined in the racial crisis by becoming, in fact, though not in name, the white man's party. Again, this is strategy. This is not racism. But again, this is what's happened. OK. Now I want to say, and race isn't the main point. Race is not the main point. The main point is power. The main point was how, how conservatives, and in particular, how big business, how the wealthy, could move us from that first period that Mile, that, that Mile identified, a period in which we had strong government and strong unions that could both stand as counterweights to the power of concentrated wealth, how they could move us to a different period in which concentrated wealth essentially ruled the country. And the principal strategy they struck on was culture war politics, encourage working people to fear and resent each other, and to ignore the power of corporations. And within that sphere of cultural war politics, it was gender, it was sexual orientation, it was religion, it was guns, and above all else, it was race. And Donald Trump exemplifies that as well. Yes, he has risen to the fore on the, on the strength of his race baiting about Mexicans, about Muslims, to a limited extent about African Americans. But if you step back and you think, what is he actually proposing substantively? What are his, what are, what, what, what's, what's real? about what he's saying. Ignore the faux populism of this sort of crackdown on the corporation, crony capitalism. You've seen this before. In fact, Sarah Palin was all about speaking out against crony capitalism. So ignore that. What is he really proposing besides building a wall and, and, and banning all Muslims? He's proposing massive tax cuts for the very rich. Donald Trump is proposing to cut taxes back to a level we last saw in the 1890s, a one-third tax cut for the top income bracket. That's the heart of dog whistle politics. Not just using race as a way to win votes, but using race as a way to win support, popular support, for the policy preferences of the plutocrats. And so I want to pause here to be very clear. How does this work? How, do, how are these dog whistle politicians and dog whistle think tanks and dog whistle media enterprises like Fox using race in a way that wins support for the very rich? And it's a very simple formula. First, it says, resent people of color, again through coded rhetoric, illegal aliens, welfare queens, inner city crime, um, and then of course the rhetoric that juxtaposes with these threatening minorities, uh, decent hardworking taxpayers, the real Americans, the silent majority. So first, constantly build resentment of minorities. Second, identify the actual culprit, the greatest threat, not as people of color, but as government. Government, because it takes tax dollars from hardworking whites and wastes it on these undeserving minorities. 
Government, because it refuses to protect us from these marauding, threatening brown and black people in the, in, in the form of lax criminal law. Government, because it refuses to protect us through lax enforcement of the border. And now the realities of criminal law and border enforcement, of mass incarceration and mass deportation, the realities don't matter. At, at least not to these dog whistlers. What matters is the frame, the idea that it's government that's to blame because government prefers, coddles, refuses to control people of color. And so then what's the solution? Turn your back on government. Cut taxes, slash social spending, get government out of the way of the people we can trust, the corporations. And so like Miles, I would say everybody should watch Inequality for All, Robert Reich's documentary. But everybody should note that Reich doesn't have an explanation for why the policies he identifies gain so much popular support. The why is dog whistle politics. Right? It's this sort of, it's this combination of a narrative that says, and let me, let me be very clear about it, distrust, fear, people of color. Distrust government, trust the market. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up my remarks r right now by saying to progressives, what does it mean to talk about race? For most progressives, it means focus on the problems that confront people of color. All right, that is the typical conversation we have about race. 99.9% .9 of the time, if the topic is race, then the focus is people of color. And that is, in one sense, entirely appropriate. The sort of politics that I've identified has been responsible for the greatest calamities to, to, to confront uh, uh, communities of color, disinvestment from our cities, mass incarceration, mass deportation. But I want to suggest a different way of thinking about race. We should also realize that when we talk about race, we're talking about the reason so many Americans distrust government. That is, all of us as progressives want a society that is fair, inclusive, just, that works for everyone, and all of us realize we cannot achieve that society without government on our side rather than in the pockets of the corporations. But it's race that has led so many of our fellow citizens to allow government to be hijacked by the very rich. So when I want, so for progressives, I want a conversation about race that says race is about what's happening to communities of color, and race is about how our government and our economy have been hijacked by the very rich in a way that has hurt every single person in this country, whatever color their skin. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. All right. My name is Chara Torres Spellacy. I work on the intersection of campaign finance law and corporate law. I have a new book coming out uh, in June called Corporate Citizen, which deals with the phenomenon of corporate political spending in American elections. Now, I think only in America would the question even be seriously asked that whether money in politics matters or not. And what I find so puzzling about that is the facts. And the facts are these. On the Democratic side, the individual who has raised the most money is the front runner. On the Republican side, uh, a self-funded, self-proclaimed billionaire who has given his own campaign $17 million in loans is the front runner. So the idea that money doesn't matter is almost comical to me but I think that this narrative has uh, gotten some traction in this particular election cycle because of the failure of the Jeb Bush campaign. And he failed despite having over $100 million in super, fund, uh, super PAC funds backing him. And his failure, I think, was remarkable. Uh, I think in a typical presidential year, a Jeb Bush would have done better. He had executive experience, he had name recognition, and initially he had the most money. But as I uh, wrote in a recent Brennan Center blog, even though he had the most corporate backing, and he had the most corporate backing, his biggest donor was uh, $10 million from a single corporation. 
He also had $1 million from a, a corporation called Next Era, and that's remarkable because that's a publicly traded corporation. So don't let anyone tell you that corporations are not using their citizens' united rights. Corporations started spending in 2010, and they have not stopped. Another thing that is typical of this year is big spenders have been a highly concentrated group. As the New York Times reported, just 158 families have provided nearly half of the early money in efforts to capture the White House. They are overwhelmingly white, rich, older, and male in a nation that is being remade by the young, by women, and by black and brown voters. But in many ways, this is not a typical year. And here are the five lessons that I've gleaned from this election cycle so far. Lesson number one, nothing beats free. I think the confounding factor and why money in politics uh, has not mattered as much as it usually does has been the media's disproportionate free coverage of one candidate early on, Donald Trump. While all, all other candidates had to do ad buys or they had to say outrageous things to try to catch a media cycle, Trump could hold events and it was nearly guaranteed the cable news networks would cover it uh, entirely for free. And some of the messages that were coming out of those Trump campaigns and, and the messages from other competing candidates who were trying to catch a news cycle were outrageously xenophobic, racist, or anti-religious. Lesson number two, in a 22 candidate field, picking winners is more difficult for donors. And perhaps in a field this big, fame is playing more of a role than campaign spending. I think what we might be seeing is what I will call the Schwarzenegger effect. If you will recall when Arnold Schwarzenegger was first elected the governor of California, it was in Gray Davis's recall election where there were dozens of candidates and Schwarzenegger was one of the most famous ones. And just as Arnold Schwarzenegger rode that fame to the governorship of California, I, uh, it is possible that Donald Trump could ride his fame all the way to the White House. Lesson number three, the herd can be wrong. Uh, <laughs> Jeb, Pack, Jeb, uh, Jeb Bush's super PAC, Right to Rise, had lots of bright people giving to it, but it turned out to be an utter waste of money. Lesson four, and I think the undertold story of this campaign has been that organizing small donors can still keep an outsider candidate in the mix. The last time I checked, the Sanders campaign had over three million individual donations, and he's been able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Secretary Clinton in ad buys and arguably in electoral wins. Uh, lesson number five, a self-financed campaign is not always benign. If all of what I've said is not odd enough, candidate Trump is spending an enormous of amount of his campaign dollars on Trump-owned businesses. His campaign is uh, paying rent to Trump-owned properties. It is buying food at Trump-owned restaurants. It is paying for flights on Trump-owned planes. Mr. Trump has loaned his campaign over $17 million. Now, the way that the Supreme Court typically looks at a self-finance campaign is that an individual cannot corrupt themselves. Well, I think we are about to test that proposition. Um, especially if more money comes into the Trump campaign from what you would call mom and pop donors. These small donors may end up paying off Trump's personal loan. And then what will be left in the campaign is this money from these mom and pop donors. But it will be recycling back into Trump-owned businesses. And so here, this is, a, I think, a new and novel way for corporate money to be involved in politics. 
And because typically the, can the candidate and the vendor are not the same person, but here it looks like uh, increasingly that is the case. So in other words, I think what we are witnessing is a walking, talking conflict of interest. Meanwhile, uh, we have potentially the most racially diverse American electorate ever, uh, but the funders are largely unrepresentative of that diversity, especially if you put corporate donors into the mix. A, a corporate political donor like the GEO Group, which is a private prison group, which has given uh, the Rubio campaign $100,000, I think is highly unlikely to be representative of those 50,000 new 18-year-old Hispanics who join the American electorate every single month. So I will end with this thought. Uh, David Frum has a really brilliant piece in The Atlantic called Twilight of the Super PAC. And I think Mr. Frum is asking precisely the right question. Super PACs are enriching the people who run them, but are they helping anyone else? I think Mr. Frum's answer and my answer is no. Thank you. Lord Ornstein. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, I do want to offer a couple of uh, words of comfort here. We'll be hearing a lot about Donald Trump. Uh, everybody's scared, but I just want to reassure you, if <coughs> Trump is elected president, before long he'll leave us for a younger country. So. <laughs> Our national nightmare won't last all that long. Uh, Jonathan mentioned uh, the last book I did with Tom Mann, It's Even Worse Than It Looks. And uh, very shortly, within a matter of two weeks, we will have a new uh, version out, which is now called It's Even Worse Than It Was. So <laughs> that tells you where I'm coming from. Uh, I want to provide a little structure, a broader structure, to the uh, political dynamic that we have right now. And I would start with two phrases, angry populism and partisan tribalism. Now, the angry populism is a driving force in our politics right now. And of course, we always get it. It's something that's deeply ingrained in America's DNA. Whenever we hit difficult economic times, populism arises. If you go back to the late 1980s and early 1990s, we had raging populism, even though the economy was basically not all that bad, it was just stagnant. But what triggered it as much as anything else was a pay raise engineered by all of our elites. Ronald Reagan, as he left office, worked with George Herbert Walker Bush as he came into office and all the congressional leaders to get a substantial pay raise for all uh, top elected officials, members of Congress, judges, cabinet officers, it had been a decade or more since there had been any pay increase, and they wanted to make up for it with what amounted to about a 25% raise. Most Americans who had gotten at best 1% cost of living adjustments were just enraged. And we saw the rise of Pat Buchanan on the right, Ross Perot in the center, and uh, uh, Ralph Nader on the left. And remember that uh, along about June, May to June of that election year in 1992, Ross Perot in the polls led both major party candidates, Bill Clinton and George Herbert Walker Bush in the polls. Uh, a short while later, he proved that his trade table was not in its full upright and locked position. <laughs> and he plunged, but he got 19% of the popular votes. That populism brought with it what populism almost always does, which is a substantial dose of nativism and protectionism and isolationism. You remember Ross Perot talking about that giant sucking sound of jobs going south to Mexico. And now we have populism back in a deeper vein. And what triggered it this time uh, it was the bailout in the fall of 2008 engineered by all of our elites in Washington and in New York. And the reaction of most Americans was not, thank God they saved us from a global depression, but they all got together to bail out the miscreants that got us into this mess and then gave them bonuses while the rest of us lost our houses or saw the one big asset we have in our homes plummet in value, lost our jobs or got stuck in jobs where we simply couldn't move and had bad things happen. And that, uh, along with uh, an economy that has struggled, 
led to uh, a more pungent version of populism that gave us Donald Trump. And if you look at Donald Trump, the calling cards start with nativism. Uh, every speech he gives, every debate appearance focuses on protectionism that we're getting cleaned uh, every day by Mexico, China, and other countries on trade. And of course, he also has distinguished himself from the other candidates by ripping George W. Bush for lying to us about weapons of mass destruction and getting us uh, stuck in a foreign conflict. Uh, and uh, even though he wants to bomb ISIS into submission, he will not send American troops anywhere. So we have all of those characteristics. And it's not just Donald Trump. Now, populism also brings with it a distrust of leaders of all types and at all levels. And it is no great surprise that if you look at every poll of Republicans from the early summer last year on to now, and whether it's all Republicans or registered Republicans or activist Republicans, 60 to 70% of the preferences have been for outsider or insurgent candidates, 20% or so for the insiders. It's for that reason as much as any others that I wrote a piece back in August called Why This Time Might Be Different when uh, the pundit uh, uh, uh were all saying, and that includes most of my political science colleagues, oh, it's all going to shake out the way it did before. Yeah, we had the Herman Keynes of the world. They rise, they fall, but it'll be an establishment figure who will emerge. And that was not at all clear, given uh, what we were seeing. Now, add to that the partisan tribalism. Of course, we have polarization, and we've had polarization for some time. Polarization itself does not mean you can't solve problems. Uh, look at Orrin Hatch and Ted Kennedy. They found ways, despite vastly different political views, to make some horse trades, to find some common ground. They gave us children's uh, health insurance, among many other things. Uh, but what we've had for the last several years is tribal. And tribalism means if you're for it, I'm against it, even if I was for it yesterday. And it means you view the other side as the enemy. Now, Republicans, as uh, Barack Obama became president, uh, with Democrats uh, having robust majorities in both houses, looked at that phenomenon and tried to figure out how they could operate within that context. And using a ruthlessly pragmatic strategy, borrowing heavily from what Newt Gingrich had done uh, to gain a Republican majority in 1994 after 40 years of Democratic hegemony, basically uh, went out and said, we're going to exploit partisan tribalism. We're going to delegitimize the president, vote in unison as a parliamentary minority against everything and make Americans so disgusted with politics in Washington that they will say anything would be better than this, knowing that with Democrats in charge of everything, they would see the Democrats as responsible. They were at the helm. Of course, it worked like a charm in 2010, and it was replicated again in 2014. But along the way, what Republicans did was to basically give themselves and the country an enormous self-inflicted wound. What they did in 2009 and 2010, led by the young guns, you remember a book of that name uh, in 2009 with a cover reminiscent of the Kevin Costner movie with Eric Cantor, Kevin McCarthy, Paul Ryan, the three faces of a new conservatism and they went around the country and recruited Tea Party candidates. The populism of course brought with it the Occupy movement and the Tea Party movement and told them, go out there and tell them that you're gonna vote against an increase in the debt ceiling and then you'll use the debt ceiling to force Barack Obama to his knees and we're gonna give you budget cuts, we're gonna blow up government as we know it. And of course, none of that worked and none of that happened. Then in 2012, they told their angry populist constituents, don't worry, after all, Barack Obama will be a passing storm, a one-term president. How could the American people having now seen what the Kenyan socialist has done, re-elect him. And then the excuse going to towards 2014 was, hey, look, we're still outnumbered two to one. They've got the Senate. We get that back, we outnumber them two to one, and we'll definitely bring him to his knees, repeal Obamacare, Dodd-Frank, and end government as we know it. None of that happened. And the angry populism merged with the partisan tribalism 
so that a distaste for their own leaders, a sense that they had been repeatedly seduced and abandoned, merged together with a view of Democrats and Obama as evil and the enemy. And that has brought us a combustible combination that means that Ted Cruz, whose calling card from inside the Senate has been going on the Senate floor and doing something nobody had ever done before, calling his own leader a liar, and wearing like a badge of honor the distaste and contempt that all of his colleagues feel towards him, and Donald Trump being the two major contenders for Republican nomination. Doesn't mean that one of them will win, but it doesn't mean that they'll lose either. What it does mean is that having destroyed confidence in government, and along the way following another strategy which is deeply disturbing, which is to try to undercut the capacity of government to do anything by basically denigrating all of those who are there, uh, forcing them uh, into humiliating positions, keeping them from doing any kind of continued training so that they could keep up with what's going on in the world, they have undermined government and led even more to a distaste in the public for it, which is going to make governing in the future more difficult. Now, I want to add a couple of other notes following uh, on what Ian and Chara uh, have said. Partisan tribalism is deeply disturbing. You begin to view the other side as the enemy. The idea of doing anything that works in an American democracy that requires building coalitions across all lines the legitimacy of domestic policy, as the late great Daniel Patrick Moynihan frequently pointed out, in a vast extended republic like ours, depends on the legitimacy that comes from a broad leadership coalition saying, trust us, this is going to hurt, but it's good for all of us. That's bad. Add to that the reality that Ian mentioned, that we have a party that is becoming a white party and another party that's becoming a party of minorities. So layer race on top of partisan tribalism. And that is a very dangerous combination as we go forward for the ability of this country to keep itself together. And I want to add one note to what Chara said about campaign finance, uh, something that I hope will reassure my common cause friends as well. It's absolutely the case that the super PACs have benefited the people uh, who are uh, making money from them uh, and that, uh, among other things, uh, 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 Michael Bloomberg had lots of people whispering in his ear, you've got to do this, you can win, because they had visions of Maseratis and Mercedes from all the money they would make uh, if he did run. But it's also important to remember that this presidential contest has been shaped by political money. We normally have a ruthless winnowing out process that narrows a field down very quickly. Having a few sugar daddies means you can stay in longer. The longer you stay in, the more incentive there is to stay in, and that has worked to the benefit of Donald Trump and Ted Cruz. Norman Brayman has kept uh, uh, Marco Rubio afloat, uh, uh, among other things. The second important point to make is the further you go down the food chain, the more political money matters and the more big money matters. You move down to House and Senate races, and one thing I can guarantee you, the uh, almost billion dollars that the Koch brothers have pulled together from their allies and from themselves for, to influence the 2016 election, if they look at a presidential race where their candidate is not going to win, more of that money will go into Senate and House contests, and it will have a big impact, a bigger impact there. You can buy a state legislature for next to nothing now, as the Koch brothers did with the Kansas legislature for $3 million. And the biggest cancer of all of money in our politics is judicial elections. And there again, the crisis of legitimacy with Washington, Congress, the presidency not working together we are moving to a point where not only do we have a Supreme Court that is polarized in a partisan fashion in the same way, but elected judges and the election of judges is itself an abomination where big money goes in for leverage to get ideological judges that fit your pattern or to blow up those judges who don't, where a judge can sit in a case and think, you know, if I rule against that defendant, I may get $10 million poured in in the final weeks of a campaign to slime me, and how am I going to raise money? 
only from the people who practice in front of me. It will shape decisions and delegitimize the one thing that's most important in a democracy, which is judicial independence. But we got a lot of work to do, and I want to thank a lot of people in this room for getting engaged in that work. Well, well you've all. <laughs> You've all given us uh, a lot to chew on uh, in just the space of, of 30 minutes. And we have 30 minutes until the end, um, actually, of this session. So, so that we get quickly to questions and answers from the audience, I just want to point out there are microphones on either end of the room. I feel like a flight attendant on either end of the room there. Um, please line up there. But I want to throw out this one question for all of you to answer. And then we'll go, we'll go to questions. And that is, listening to your, <clears throat> each of your presentations, they're all very heavy on Trump and the Re Republicans, and understandably so, as someone who writes about both all the time. What I'm wondering is, where are the Democrats in all of this? Because money and race figure prominently in the Democratic race uh, for the presidential nomination. Uh, so, would love for you to, whoever wants to jump in first, but I would love for all of you to talk about the Democrats from your respective perches. Um, if I might, so the, so the Democrats are, are part of this story, unfortunately. The Democrats made the decision early in 1970 or so, realizing that race could be a wedge issue used against them, uh, but they made the mistake of thinking that race was simply a backlash, that it was simply arising organically. And they thought if they stayed silent, backed away from people of color, it would just blow over. That clearly didn't work. Um, so then they, uh, meaning Bill Clinton and the New Democrats, adopted a different strategy. They decided that they too would dog whistle. And when Bill Clinton ran in 1992, he ran on themes of ending welfare as a way of life, of cracking down on crime, and of cutting the federal deficit. That is, he picked up the Republican themes. So a lot of progressives look at the Clinton years as the years in which the Democratic Party uh, created deep alliances with Wall Street. Yes, it did. But it did so in connection with a politics that said, we're going to turn our back on people of color. We're going to turn our back on working people. We're going to turn our back on liberalism, because liberalism itself has become tainted. And we're going to create these new Democrats who essentially campaign as uh, Reagan Republicans. And so I think that the, 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 the Democrats have been steeped in this. Um, in terms of the current campaign, Hillary Clinton is much more progressive on race than she has been in the past. Um, but she was involved in dog whistling in the 90s. She was involved in dog whistling in 2008. She definitely understands the power of race to divide the country. I'm not sure that she has committed herself to trying to create a new energized majority that gets beyond racial division, in fact, m more broadly. I don't think she has committed herself to the proposition that we cannot recover control of the Democratic Party, of our governance, of our marketplace, unless there's broad social mobilization, which is exactly the critique that Bernie Sanders is offering. But unfortunately, I think for Bernie Sanders, I think he understands this basic truth that we need this broad social mobilization, but he hasn't quite grasped that that broad social mobilization requires that we address how race hurts everybody. When Sanders talks about race, he still talks in that sort of um, progressive model in which racial justice is an issue for people of color. Wh whereas what he needs to recognize is it's an issue for people of color and it's an issue for our democracy and our economy. And if he could make that pivot, then I think he'd be in a much better position of saying, we need a true 99% coalition, but to get there, we're gonna have to address race. So, um, hmm. On the Democratic mm -hmm. side, and again, I'm much more obsessed with um, corporations than I am with race, honestly, and there is corporate backing of the Clinton campaign's uh, super PAC, but it's pretty small. Um, there is no corporate money backing Bernie Sanders, like when he says, <laughs> I'm being funded by small donors. He's not lying. He is really being funded by these tiny $25, $20, $30 um, donations. And 
But what I think is sort of interesting is there seems to be this generational split among African Americans and among Hispanic voters where the um, older generation seems to be going for Clinton, but the younger generation seems to be going for Sanders. Hey, Chara, but before, yeah. Norm, before you get in yeah. there, I wanted to ask you, uh, Chara, um, in terms of these small donors for Bernie Sanders, mm -hmm. these small donors have allowed Senator Sanders to, in a lot of, I think in a lot of quarters, outraise Hillary mm -hmm. Clinton. So is it possible that these small donors are, are basically a, a bottomless well for the revolution uh, that Bernie Sanders is trying to lead? I'm not sure if they're a bottomless well. I mean, the advantage which um, the two Obama um, campaigns realize is the beauty of a small donor is that they are not maxed out in terms of hard money donations. And so you can go back to a small donor and ask them for an additional $25, where if you have a maxed out um, hard money donor, they, they can't give you more. They have to, again, um, start funneling things to the super PACs. And the problems with doing that uh, is then the candidate loses control over that spending. So uh, it, it's interesting to speculate on why the parties are, are different in this uh, race and its dynamic, uh, while there are some similarities. Obviously, we have angry populism on both sides. We had the emergence of the Occupy Wall Street movement just as we had the emergence of the Tea Party movement. They were different in an important respect. The Tea Party movement itself was from the bottom up. But they organized. They got candidates. They've been very actively involved uh, in uh, politics at all levels. The Occupy movement occupied. They went out there, took over some territory for a while, put up tents. Uh, when it got uncomfortable, they pretty much dispersed. Now, they remain as a force of people, which has allowed Bernie Sanders to emerge and to have some enormous impact. But obviously, not enough. And there's a difference, I think, in a couple of ways between Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives. On the conservative side, first of all, you have an extraordinarily important and robust tribal media, much more than you do on the liberal side. And if you think about that tribal media, I had a conversation last week with Charlie Cook, uh, who said to me, um, you know, I can see why Trump is getting this support from working class whites. But I was up in New Hampshire at a, at a Trump rally and this late model Cadillac pulls up. These two people in their early 60s get out, very well dressed. Turns out they've got a small business. They're doing extremely well. They've prospered over the last few years and they're still for Trump. What's going on there? And I said, I'll tell you most likely what's going on. They watch Glenn Beck and Sean Hannity. They listen to Rush Limbaugh. They read some of these blogs. And what do they see and hear in commercials most often? gold commercials. Why gold? Because if the apocalypse is near, you want to buy gold. And that's the message that sells. It's an apocalyptic message. And they get emails from their friends and relatives telling them that this country is on the verge of collapse, that nothing good has happened, that Obama has failed entirely. And they watch news and they get an awful lot of that. And then, if you believe that, and if you believe that all the actors in Washington have created this mess, that weak need Republican leaders joined with uh, uh, Obama and basically have uh, made us uh, a disaster area, why not roll the dice? Democrats don't have quite that message. And Democrats love Barack Obama, for the most part. There's uh, an enormous divide there. And if you're in that position and you don't think government is a total disaster and that it's got to do some things, then the Sanders message may resonate, but it's not going to resonate nearly as much. And a Clinton who has very cleverly attached herself to Barack Obama, while you see Bernie Sanders campaigning out there with uh, Cornell West, who basically called Barack Obama a war criminal, um, that has, I think, hurt Sanders to some significant degree uh, as well. Uh, now, I think it's also interesting. There is no doubt that the Clintons played dog whistle politics in 2008, but Hillary Clinton is getting 85 to 90% support from African Americans. And Bernie Sanders, 
despite uh, trying to make those appeals, gets nowhere. Some of that is uh, getting a little distance from Obama and Obama's policies. Some of it is that a lot of people out there saw what the Clintons did as a political move, but there's a long level of attachment there. And we're not gonna see that populism stay in the same vein. But it's also important to note that because of his huge amounts of money, and because Democratic rules mean proportional representation in every contest, Bernie Sanders can lose almost all of the big contests down the road, and he's still gonna have 40% or more of the delegates going into the convention. He has every reason to stay there. He will have enormous leverage at the convention, and one of the things that is a challenge to Hillary Clinton is trying to figure out how you can satisfy Sanders and his supporters without losing the center uh, where you're gonna need to have at least some place to be to win the election. And we may well see an Elizabeth Warren as a running mate as a consequence. Hmm. I know that um, Ian wants to uh, jump in on the uh, tribalism aspect of what you were talking about, Norm, and then we'll open it up to questions. Please, if you have a question, go to the microphones on, on either side. Ian. So, so I wanted to say uh, I agree very much with, with much of Norm's analysis, um, uh, but I wanted to address in particular the metaphor of tribalism. Uh, to me, I think what, what Norm's trying to identify is the sort of increasing fragmentation, the, the way in which we're increasingly hermetically sealed from each other, the sense that, that there's this basic antagonism between people. I agree with all of that. I worry about tribalism as a metaphor, and I worry about it for two reasons. One, I think we use the word tribal in a way that conjures a sort of a naturalistic imagery, that people are somehow predisposed to be divided against each other. And this distracts us from, the, from, from seeing that these are in fact manufactured differences, that, that elites have a tremendous uh, desire to see American people fractured and, 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 uh, and, and fractious and, and, and at each other's throat. So the, the, we, we need, I think, a metaphor that reminds us that this is manufactured. Second, I worry that the metaphor of tribalism creates a false symmetry. It suggests, especially when it's tied to race, that people are naturally sorting by race somehow uh, so that there's a white party and that there's a multiracial party and that these are symmetrical dynamics. They're not symmetrical dynamics. In 1960, 23% of African Americans voted for the Republican Party. In 1964, the year after they began dog whistling, that percentage dropped to zero. This is not a natural sorting. This is a sorting that, that flows from a decision by one of our two major parties that it would dedicate itself to stimulating racial resentments in our society. And so what you have is um, a party that is overwhelmingly white. The fact that whites are Republicans, that's not a problem in itself. It's that the party is whiter than most country clubs in a country that's increasingly diverse. Right? That is, it is speaking not to people of European descent, but to people who are the most racially fearful, and it's encouraging those sorts of racial fear. And so I think that there's a, there's a way in which we need to keep hold of the idea that A, this is manufactured, and B, this isn't a symmetrical sorting. This is a result of a purposeful politics of racial divide and conquer. Uh, well, I agree. Go fast and then a question. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and. Uh, it's interesting that Reince Priebus's, now it turns out, aptly named autopsy uh, for his uh, party, uh, talked about how pragmatically Republicans were doomed to be a permanent minority unless they were able to reach out and broaden their coalition. But I think what happens to a party, uh, even with a lot of people who understand that they're headed down a terrible path, is the short-term pain of changing uh, which will bring you a potential long-term gain, is just too great. And that's where the tribal media, which is asymmetric, mm -hmm. comes into play as well. Mm -hmm. You know, look at Eric Cantor losing his election to Dave Bratt in a primary right. on the immigration issue. Right. And it was because, as much as anything, Laura Ingram and Mark Levin, with uh, a lot of free media, went down there and organized against him. And when you've got that kind of potent force and the uh, tribal media on the Republican side is dominated by a nativist anti-immigration mm -hmm. stand, which is, right. after all, itself a symbol for racial divide, right. um, it's very hard to stand up against that. 
As I wrote at the time, um, autopsies are done on dead things. Yes, yes. Um, question here. Hi, uh, Adam Liaz with Demos. I want to thank the panel for a fascinating and important discussion. My question is, so we're talking about race and money. Um, if we were to address the outside, outsized role of big money in politics in significant ways, and so money wasn't such a barrier to entry for folks of all walks of life running for office, what impact, if any, would this have on the racial dynamics of our politics, our elections at the presidential level? Would it help a little bit, help a lot, or not at all? <laughs> sure. Um, I mean, one of the interesting things with uh, the increasing diversity uh, in America is it tends to be concentrated in states that are not swing states. So you have an enormous amount of diversity in New York. You have an enormous amount of diversity in California. So from a um, electoral map in terms of the presidential election, um, a lot of the, that, I think, diversity is going to be you know, sort of wasted vote. Like the, there won't be a huge impact. But in Senate races, in, um, in House races, if you could get, um, solve some of the money in politics problems, I think you would see much more diverse uh, congressional delegations getting elected. You know, we, we have, I think, a, a, a serious problem here. Getting heterogeneous congressional districts is going to be almost impossible because the big sword is real. Uh, that's a major part of it. Another part of it is that the way Republicans and minorities have worked together uh, with the Voting Rights Act, it has given us more minority representation, but it has also made most of the districts in the South that are not heavily minority almost all white. And getting around that, because it, it changes the way people talk even in their own districts, uh, is a problem. And then throw in the reality that uh, the nature of representation in the Senate especially gives added weight to the smaller states, and those smaller states are generally all white. So it's really going to be a challenge to try and create more diversity uh, for elected officials who will then pay attention to people, even if they're not going to vote for them, in ways that will just keep them from getting so pissed off that they'll turn out in large numbers. So I, so I want to I want to come at it at a slightly different angle. One way to think about race and big money is to say, okay, who are the big donors? Um, oh, look, they're overwhelmingly white. Um, but another way of saying that is, you know, the New York Times had this great piece a little bit ago that said, okay, if we look at the 400 most powerful people in the country, they're overwhelmingly white. Um, what's the insight there? And, and I want to say about the big donors, well, well you know, look, one insight is this is a country founded on racial hierarchy, no accident. But here's the other insight. For the very rich, they're not white in a functional way. Who cares? Their loyalties are to other very rich people. And they can be from Russia, and they could be from Saudi Arabia, they could be to, from, from Mexico. They can be from whatever uh, leadership of whatever country offers them a tax shelter. They don't care that much about uh, whites in the United States because they don't care that much about people in the United States. That's why they're busy offshoring all their jobs and offshoring all their profits. So that race and big money go together most importantly in the sense that big money has realized that it can use race against the rest of us. That's the really dangerous connection. So that it's big money, Americans for Prosperity, um, uh, uh, um, um, uh, Murdoch and Fox News, it's big money that sees that it can use race as a wedge issue to get the rest of us thinking that the biggest threats in our lives come from people of other races, rather than understanding that the biggest threat from our, in our lives comes from increasing corporate power that is more than ever global and disconnected from the fate of this country and its working people. Question here. Yes, um, I know we focus a lot on race, but I want to raise another issue that's been talked about in our election is the Supreme Court vacancy. Can each of you, or one of you, touch on how you see the vacancy playing out the rest of the election? So uh, I will tell you, I uh, uh, wrote a letter to the president uh, that was signed by 15 top scholars of uh, uh, politics, uh, history, and law 
decrying what the Senate is doing, which is uh, unprecedented, and the idea that uh, is in the talking point that we have uh, not had anything like this in 80 years is, is simply false. It's a reflection of uh, uh, some of the ways in which uh, leaders have tried to delegitimize the president, you know, not holding a hearing on the budget, uh, refusing to even countenance a Supreme Court nomination. Those are different ways of operating, different norms than we've had in our politics before. Uh, Mitch McConnell is gonna do whatever he can to keep from having a hearing or doing anything, in part because, as Chara knows very well, uh, and as I know, because I've been subject to his wrath uh, on this set of issues, <laughs> nothing matters to Mitch McConnell more than keeping Citizens United uh, and McCutcheon in place. And he doesn't want to see that slipping away, even though it would be some time before it happened. But it's going to be, I think, very tricky for Republicans as, uh, we, uh, as time passes it, it, for two reasons. One is, uh, whenever you talk about a presidential election and people say it really doesn't matter, um, you know, my mantra has always been two words, Supreme Court. But it's theoretical. Now it's not theoretical, mm -hmm. it's real. And mm -hmm. that may create a mobilization and all the talk, for example, on the Democratic side of uh, people who are for Bernie who won't turn out for Hillary, uh, I think that will change and it will crystallize. The second is in the Senate. If in fact uh, Barack Obama nominates a very impressive woman judge from Iowa who has been praised in a gushing fashion by Chuck Grassley, who's up for re-election, uh, and Grassley refuses, as he has pledged he would, to meet with her, much less hold a hearing. There's going to be an awful lot of heat on Chuck Grassley in Iowa. And we're talking about who has a majority in the Senate, which has an enormous impact on whether you get even a hearing or something moving forward with the next president for a Supreme Court nominee. And you put Iowa into play, and it changes that dynamic a whole lot. So uh, just so we're all clear, when there's a 4-4 split on the Supreme Court, um, like they vote 4-4, that means that the lower court ruling uh, is affirmed. And there are so many cases where we might get a 4-4 split, and it just became really, really important who those um, appellate court judges are and what their decisions are. So uh, just as an, an example, uh, Bob McDonnell, uh, the former governor of Virginia who was convicted for um, you know, arguably selling his, um, his public office to a, um, a friend for loans, uh, he, he was convicted, the, the Fourth Circuit uh, confirmed that conviction, and his case is going to be one of the final oral arguments in this term. And it, it is very possible that that will be a 4-4 split, which will mean that he will go to jail. And I think if uh, Scalia had lived, it is very likely that um, it could have gone the other way. And it, it, it's not just election law, questions that could be decided for four in the next, um, and, and we don't know how long this is going to last. Things like the Commerce Clause, you know, boring things like the Commerce Clause, which I have to care about because I teach constitutional law, those are going to be four, four splits. And the reason that that matters is all of our federal criminal law is based on the Commerce Clause. It matters enormously whether the Supreme Court thinks that we should have an expansive Commerce Clause or a narrow Commerce Clause. The, the stakes here could not be higher. Um, and as Norm said, we don't know what the complexion of the next Senate is going to be. It, we could very well have a Democratic President and a Democratic Senate, and then um, it is going to be very interesting because so many election law cases were 5-4 just a moment ago, and they could be 5-4 the other way. Um, so I wanted to... <laughs> 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 uh, 
as, so I want to identify myself as another constitutional law professor, and then the question is, well, you know, con law, but then how did I end up write, writing about race, politics, and plutocracy? And, and the simple answer was, I was trying to understand what had happened to the Supreme Court over the last 50 years, and that's what led me to this story, because what happened was, from Nixon, but especially with Reagan, Republicans realized they could dog whistle the Supreme Court. They could describe the Supreme Court as a bunch of judicial activists and as usurping the Constitution and as betraying our rights um, in a way that hid that what they were really talking about was the way in which the Constitution had ordered racial integration, the way in which the Constitution had allowed abortion, the way in which the, the Constitution, or the, the Supreme Court, I should say, um, uh, had, had called for um, uh, a, a whole set of reforms and a whole set of, and had permitted a whole set of economic regulations. That became the subject. So on the one hand, you get this very strong conser conservative rhetoric of a Supreme Court out of control in judicial activism. And on the other hand, you get the appointment of a number of justices who are very much uh, ruling in the interests of big business. And, and this isn't an accident. Uh, Clint Bullock was one of the sort of um, 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 uh, sort of brains behind this who said in the 1980s, what we want is cons as conservatives is fundamentally anti-democratic. What we want is cons uh, as conservatives is a system in which government, that is democracy, cannot regulate corporations. And the only way to get that is through the one anti-democratic branch of our government, the Supreme Court. And, and this, so what is at stake now is precisely what Chara said, um, uh, what's at stake is a court that is poised to be either sort of a coordinate branch of government or instead a break on democratic reform. Um, the right has, has successfully politicized the Supreme Court, the left has not, in the sense of making its partisans realize that this is tremendously important to the future of the country. And, and I think Norm is right. Um, you know, uh, um, Justice Scalia's timely demise is going to help crystallize that issue in a way that it hasn't before. Okay, we have just five minutes left and two questioners, so I'm going to ask that you, I'm going to get you both in, but I ask that your questions be really short and directed to one of the three panelists or one of you answer the question. Go ahead. I'm Daniel Simon with Voices for Progress. I've been thinking about the political tribalism issue over the past year because it seems that devotion to party, especially one of the two parties, uh, takes precedence over any other factor. Uh, if, there data, if there's data that shows things are getting better, it's the government cooking the books. If there's a scientific fact that uh, is in conflict with an ideological result, then the scientists are in some cabal. Um, and where cooperation with the other party is seen as treason, these days, I'm wondering how one overcomes that kind of split. Um, it seems that arguing from facts is particularly effective since there's kind of an epistemic closure in order to preserve the ideological commitment. Norm. Uh, it, how do we get out of it? That's a really uh, difficult question to answer in an optimistic way. Um, I think we're gonna muddle through for a while. There are previous periods in American history where we've had divisions of this sort it usually takes 10 or 15 years uh, to sort it out. Sometimes uh, it can get sorted out through a civil war. Um, what troubles me now, as much as anything, is that if you look in the past, you could say there's a rule of three. You lose three presidential elections in a row and a party that's gone off the rails starts to come back. You lose once, you say, oh, how could we have picked that idiot for a candidate? You lose twice and you say, duh, we did it again. By the third time, you realize it's something more. But the structural nature of house elections and the fact that state houses and governorships are mostly in off years means that the inexorable demographic changes are not going to have the same impact for a long time. Republicans are going to continue to win at many other levels, and that may keep things from changing. At the same time, because of this tribal media and the social media magnification of it, crazy things out there, you look at the next generation coming up into Congress, for example, of people in state legislatures, they're crazier than the ones in Congress. <laughs> look at some of the things that they say. And so it's going to be a while before we get out of this. And it's uh, frankly a scary phenomenon. It's partly why we have to double down on trying to at least get some of the changes in place to enlarge the electorate instead of suppressing votes, 
to change the money system, which uh, magnifies a lot of these issues. Uh, and by the way, changing the money system in part because we're getting this, you know, this notion that corporations are people uh, is crazy to begin with. But when, as Ian said, corporations are no longer loyal to America, uh, so it's not just that they have one motive while most of us have many. Their motive is to make money, but they may have a motive which includes uh, promoting the foreign policy of another country over ours it's a really dangerous phenomenon, and I think that's why the work of people in this room becomes even more important. And final question, right. real fast. Quick question, Diallo Brooks, uh, People for the American Way. How do we have intentional conversations about race that goes beyond the civil rights movement? Our democracy was founded, these corporations were founded off of slave labor in this country. Right. Um, and so often we get in these spaces and we don't have intentional conversations about race beyond the civil rights movement, right. about the intentionality of racial division as our democracy, so-called democracy, was formed. How do we have those conversations? I'll direct that to Ian, because you did uh, mention, I think, earlier about the power dynamics that are at play. Great. Ian. So, so I think that there are two big fears in America, and one of them is the wallet, and the other is status. And I think progressives have been most comfortable talking about people's pocketbook issues, because that seems to unify us. But it disregards the way in which we are in fact quite divided and purposefully divided in terms of status issues. Now, in terms of status, I've really emphasized race, but, you, but, but we really ought to, we're also talking gender. We're also talking sexual orientation, disability, uh, religion. All of these are major sources of, of anxiety because we have changed remarkably over the last 50 years. We've changed demographically in the simple complexion of the country, but we've changed socially in the sense that we are working really hard as a society to dismantle hierarchies of race, of gender, of sexual orientation, of, of religion, of ability, right? And all of that is creating insecurity. And, and so to this gentleman's question, the left has to stop pretending that what unifies us is class. Yes, we are all deeply concerned about pocketbook issues, but we are also deeply concerned about who we are in society and whether we're respected, um, what our future is, and what we can contribute, how we should feel about ourselves. And the left has to talk about them simultaneously. So, so, so the crux of it is the left has to realize that talking about race is not just a moral issue about what's happening with people of color. Talking about race is central to the survival of a progressive government, go governance, central to the restoration of democracy. And if the left really believed that, then every progressive institution would have as a component of its, uh, would have as a component, a serious sustained effort to address race and how it works structurally in the United States. And on that note, <laughs> thank you very much. Ian Haney Lopez, Tara Torres Spelosi, and Norm Arnstein. Thank you, Jonathan. That was great.